Hey folks, Dave from Nerdarchy, for Nerds by Nerds, and uh, today I'm hanging out with myself. What's going on, all my nerds out there? So, uh, Rich with Esper Genesis was supposed to be on today, and we were in the Zoom call when he had a personal emergency come up. And it was definitely one of those things when you're listening to one side of a conversation kind of in the distance going, well, this does not sound good at all. So hopefully he's able to resolve everything and everything is okay and gets that taken care of. Um, and I wish him the best of luck. So that being said, you guys have me and I have no idea what we're talking about today. Uh, we're, we're going to be talking to Rich about Esper Genesis, which is kind of a... Uh, well, it's a science science fiction, science fantasy setting for 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. They've got the release coming up. And I know in Origins, they're going to be doing... Um, they're going to be doing uh, their their own organized play. <laughs> yeah, you can come in, Anthony. Uh, definitely, if you're available. I will shoot you a link. It'll be far. It'll be far better than you people listening to me yammer on about who knows what. It was about to get weird up in here. But uh, yeah. So uh, unfortunately, these things happen, and when they do, we just have to roll with them and adapt and overcome. And let's see what we got here. Just bear with me, folks. I uh, tried to get you guys Nate the Nerd Arc, but he's in the middle of a, a small child feeding. I don't know what he was feeding the child to. But, you know, I, I think that I didn't know if that would be suitable for on air. Hey, Anthony. What? I got to turn you off on my uh, actual watching you. <laughs> I know, I'm hearing it. <laughs> I'm hearing it. Hearing me once is bad enough, let alone hearing me twice. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> it's like the uh, dark side of the force of the mirror room, but just Dave. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no one, no one needs that in their life. No one. <laughs> if they do, it, it's got to be a really strange fetish. <laughs> your, uh, your guest dropped off. I'll jump in and break your balls online. Perfect. <laughs> that works. <laughs> What's going on, man? I feel like I haven't seen, talked to you in forever. Yeah, we haven't played in a long time. I've been playing with, uh, playing the uh, online game with all your cronies. I know, I know. You're cheating on me. <laughs> <laughs> so DM Don has a question in the chat. Any advice how to, how you can get a wider variety of people at my drinks and dragons nights? I don't have a problem with the crowd I have, but I'm trying to get more people out. Any advice? You mean like more ethnicity, more gender? I don't range. I I don't know if it means specifically that, or or just in general, like you know, it's the you know the, maybe they get a good crowd, but it's the same crowd. Yeah, I saw so a lot There's of There's more people in general. Sorry, I miss I misread it. Um Yeah, it's tough. You know, I think um it's probably just a matter of marketing, you know, and figuring out figuring out, you know, how how to market it locally. That that could be part of it. Um I don't know if you guys have done any like press releases. Uh but there is a couple like nerdy, geeky uh publications that are right there in Philadelphia. My question would be like, how many DMS do you have? Right. Cause if it's just one person, then it's going to be real tough for you to expand. But if you have multiple DMS, then you know, those DMS can bring more people. And if you're running like one shots, then it's a little bit easier for people to come in and be like, I'll sit down for a one shot and you have a couple GMs ready to go. I don't know. That's a lot of work, but. Yeah, I think they do. They do get multiple GMs. They got multiple people running games, is my understanding. And if it's like a, you know, what I'm saying if it's kind of like one of those like con atmospheres where it's demo the game kind of deal. You know, you might you might pull in some new people who are just on the fence and interested. But if it feels very like this is the group and these guys all know each other for a long time, then that is a real barrier of like entry. Yeah, it gets clickish. I, I don't think it's that. He's, he's, he says he's got four to eight GMs usually. That's not bad. Yeah, that's not bad at all. Yeah, yeah. I, I would have been surprised if he had two, honestly. 
I mean, it, I guess the, like uh, five or more tables. Yeah. So, so there's a couple things that spring to mind right away without actually having been out to your events. One is it on the same nights every you know of the month, kind of every every time. And is it are they at the same locations? Because you know, changing venues and changing times makes it difficult for people. But the other thing you know is like I would look at you know, local, you know, local, the local nerd and geek scene and see if you can plug into that. I mean, you guys as Carver Fortress, you know, like, like, doesn't, uh, doesn't Nicole, hasn't she written for a couple of different places? Written for places? Yeah. That, that are local. Like, what is that? Um, Philly geek something. Uh, man, I'm drawing a blank, but I know well, she a does, couple. she does writing for, um, I mean, she does writing for board game, stuff and she'll do she does writing for video game websites um where, where did you guys she, get the award from oh uh uh the philly geek awards yeah yeah we won game of the year game board game of the year uh last year for philly geek, geek awards that's that's a look at basically kind of a geeky news outlet in philadelphia so you definitely could like contact those people to look say like these are events we run certainly yeah and um, that's that's what i was thinking like if you look into more more things like that are local tap into that and then obviously maybe maybe game stores but they might see that as competition so that might be tricky i mean my thing is if you have four to eight gms and there are any players at all of those gms tables is that i mean if i had five let's put it this way if i had five dms that were running a game in any kind of consistent manner up from that as a, as a consistent event, I don't know where you go. I mean, that's about as big as you're going to get before you start being in convention. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. We used to go to MipaCon and like, I mean, they probably have more tables than that, but they're like a once a year convention. So I, I, I just think there's probably an upper threshold of how much tables you're going to get. If, if the problem is that the tables don't have enough players, then I'd probably cut back on the GMs. Honestly, <laughs> if you have eight, um, I, that's why, I mean, yeah. That's why I kind of thought maybe you were looking for more diversity in your group, which which would also help you reach out and get more players, right? One kind of gets the other. Yeah, I mean, all, all us beardy beardy old <laughs> white guys know each other, so that's not an issue. Yeah. <laughs> but you might want to, you know, if you could if you could reach out into some other demographics, you might pull in some players in that way. That's better for everybody. Yeah. Well, you know, Lewis Porter Jr. had said in one of his sorry, maybe uh, twice a year. You're right. I haven't been to it in a long time. I, I love those guys, but I haven't been there for a while. Yeah, you, you know, we're going to have to check that out. We're going to have to get that on the radar. It's definitely up your angle. Yeah. They're, they're your type of, uh, I mean, outside of the fact that they run Greyhawk, which I don't know what your thing is against Greyhawk. <laughs> they're definitely your kind of, like, people. Don't worry. It's the same thing that I have against uh, Forgotten Realms. So it's, they're, they're not alone there. They're not unique. Here's my thing. I totally agree with you on not liking... Uh, settings as a GM, right? You don't want to. You don't want to be constrained by a printed setting. Totally get it. Makes sense to me. But if you're playing in a game, what difference does it make to you whether or not the GM looks something up or not? Uh, oh, it's not about that. It's just like generic fantasy. I guess I don't know. I'm the GM most of the time too, so <laughs> that, that that may very much tinge things. But but that being said, like if you're like, oh, let's play Dark Sun or Spelljammer. Or Ebron, I'd be like, oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, I guess so you're just saying really you don't like Greyhawk and, and and Forgotten Realms because they're generic fantasy. Yeah, yeah, it's just generic fantasy. I'd rather do something that's my own. Like, like I said, and again, right? See, that's see that's my own. So that means I'm speaking more or less from the GM's chair. You're speaking from the GM side. That that, that that's my thing. Is yeah, if somebody's I, writing Greyhawk and oh, they're yeah, making stuff for Greyhawk, they are doing their own thing. <laughs> I'm just... actually I, one like one of the one of the first stream games I was invited to. Uh, TV Timmy, he's on Twitch. He's a really good GM, but he he hounded me for probably two years before I finally said yeah. And uh, it, it just actually worked out because of uh, time they, they come on his show. Plus, they, they were on the West Coast in Canada, and it was just really late for me. But uh, yeah, uh, it was a Greyhawk game. I'm like, who the fuck still plays Greyhawk? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, of, of the choices of classic settings, I think Greyhawk... I mean, classic, classic settings, I think Greyhawk is the, is the more interesting of them. Forgotten Realms is just a jambalaya of everything they wanted to put in anything. Well, you know, Forgotten Realms is awesome for 
where it came from. Like, I think it's awesome as Ed Greenwood's home homebrew campaign. Yeah, I mean, the history of them both is, yeah. is pretty interesting. I just think the results of current, I mean, at least current day Forgotten Realms is just. And then you when know. they did the, what was it, the Spell Plague or whatever from in the 4A yeah. to kind of like like make the new rules system work, I thought that was garbage. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's not I don't a like the intent, but I didn't, I didn't like it either. But I've never liked Forgotten Realms, and I played eight years of 4th Edition and living for 4th Edition in Forgotten Realms. I mean, it, you know, it's. It's got everything, and, it, and because it has everything, it feels like it has, you know, nothing. And it, it also contains all the worst tropes of, of settings, which is giant NPCs that do all the things for you. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like, that's the area It's where... high, high magic, which I don't like. Um, but you yeah. like Eberron, right? I like Eberron, but, but Eberron's approach to high magic is totally different. It makes sense. It's, you know, it's like... um. <sighs> You had a guest that was dealing, doing like a modern setting, a, day, a, a, a sci-fi setting the other day. It's like if you start from scratch and build your setting to make sense in the rules, in the context of what's going on, it's a cohesive setting. And that's what Eberron felt like, as opposed to Forgotten Realms, which felt like they started with a bunch of bits and pieces and then just layered on anything they wanted to put on it. So it never, to me, never comes together that well. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like I'd rather run in Wheel of Time setting than I would like run in Forgotten Realms because the one writer wrote it and it made sense. You know what I mean? Like, when, I guess when I was talking to uh, Rudy Rutenberg, um, you know, he was he was talking about Ebron and the the magic. Magic is really is wide in Ebron. It's not deep, so there's a right. lot of it, but it's not a lot of like real powerful magic. And one of the things that they did with that setting that I thought thought, thought was always really cool was like. Your uber powerful NPC was like twelfth level. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> Keith Baker makes a bunch of really smart game design choices when he when he goes into the setting to say, if we want this to work as a fun setting, then these are the, these are the things we have to say are are true, right? If magic is a thing that people can learn, then lots of people must learn it if it's useful, right? <laughs> like you can't just say it's super rare unless you want to say. Only people with the blood have it, but that's not true in D and D because we have wizards who literally just learn it out of books. So if there are wizards, there must be a working class of mages who have learned just enough to make a living and aren't interested in adventure. It is just like I don't see any way around that in any setting that has wizards, at least an Avancian style wizard, you know, deal. True enough. Uh, tea, tea time with Toby wants to know: Could you guys quickly spin the GIF into a roughly pet playable race? The so GIF. GIF, yeah. So I do have Mordenkainen's tome right here. It doesn't have the rules for that in there? I thought that's the, one of the reasons they put it in there. No, it's a monster. Huh. I was a little sad about that. Honestly, when I had to make a game for the spell, I asked all my friends what I should make for the spell, uh, spell jammer game. They also GIF. Every single person, first word out of their mouth, GIF. Yeah. I was like, come on, guys, I don't want to play a hippo. <laughs> uh, I, I love the GIF, but apparently the only way you could have played one is if you were an outcast or someone else played one, too. Yeah, they I mean, I like the, I like their culture. I yeah. just don't like the idea of playing a giant hippo. <laughs> <laughs> what you got against hippos, man? It's actually pretty easy. I would look at orc, half orc, and Goliath, and kind of rip those stats off. You know, you could you could probably literally just give them their ability as a, a once per rest, char uh, um, once yeah, once per long, short, long or short rest, which is just their charge thing. And give them proficiency in firearms, and bam, done. I think, uh, I don't, I mean, not knowing a whole lot about them, I would probably rescan a dwarf and change the proficiencies to, to firearms proficiencies. Because they're, they're kind of stout, right? I think and their culture's militaristic, so it makes sense for them to have, like, the, I don't know. They're, and also, they're seven foot tall. They're seven foot tall. <laughs> right, never mind, I take it back, I take it back. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, Goliath is probably true. Yeah, and I would just I would just pick the pick some abilities and replace them, you know, with their with their charge ability and give them give them knowledge firearms. But again, GIF GIF are culturally a little bit hard to use in your game because they will only operate in groups of GIF. And if you're if you're playing one that isn't, they're probably an outcast. Yeah, but that's fine. That's true for Drow, right? I hate Drow. I'm, I'm, we're about I to play a Greyhawk. We, we play. We play a Greyhawk game. 
<laughs> you know what? You know what makes me hate Trial? I think players make me hate Trial. I'm just like, ugh, the edge lord, emo, goth. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the edge the edge lord thing is just I just can't take it. Yeah, yeah. And then, people want to play the guy who's like, you know, more smoldering than everybody else and doesn't talk. I'm like, go away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I am the guys, lone wolf. I have two games of edge lords I hate in my games. Uh you know, the loner characters. And that's the Conan character, yeah. which just really pisses me off. And the and the drow and the and the Dritz character. One wants to be super gothy and edgy and, and be off to the side not talking, and the other one wants to be I'm better than everybody, and I'd never scream when I'm stabbed with a sword. How badass am I? Don't talk to me. I'm off to the side. You know, what I mean? both of those. I just. Like, oh. <laughs> yeah, I totally get that. So, like, so that I and Dritz like totally ruined Drow for me. I've never read the books. Yeah. I just don't like the culture that's come out of them. Oh, the books might be great. He might be great in the book. I don't know. <laughs> well. I... I don't know. They defined it. I mean, all right, pretty much defined Drow for Forgotten Realms. And then uh, I know Eberron, you get a little bit of a different take. You know, they went from, you know, spiders to scorpions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I don't mind Drow in, in other settings where you redefine their culture. I, I guess the other part is I find their culture unbelievable, um, which is crazy to say in fantasy, but I believe I find it unbelievable in the fantasy context even. Yeah, how could you actually have a society that exists under those yeah. precepts of chaos that doesn't actually work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if I take a hundred, you know, hundred mile view of it, I'm like, okay, that make that that's kind of neat for a fantasy world. But then when you have to like get into the weeds of it, I'm like, ah, how do they function when everybody's trying to kill each other all the time? Like, ah. so uh, Nerdator Doug wants to know: Are there drow in Ulfganian? If so, what's their deal? All right, so original. Oh, yes. that's a- Interesting. Yeah, originally we, we, our plan to do Drow was actually we were going to do more of a Steely and Unsteely, and first of all we weren't going to have the dark skin Drow. We were just going to make, if anything, we might have went the other way and made them almost like albino or just look like other elves. But um, you know they were they they rebelled and they were cast out. So, uh, or you know, or they just are on the side of the Unsteely, and there's kind of like a perpetual war that happens between the high elves and, and the dark elves, but pretty much they look the same. They live on the surface. Uh, we, we have this, uh, we have this place called the Crawlwood is where they inhabit. It's like on, uh, I think the border of the kingdom where the, where the good elves are, if for lack of better terms, but, uh, you know, uh, the Ladrin and like, basically it would be the Ladrin is kind of like our equivalent of the drow. And then under them, they have the, High elves, which would be the nobles, and then the the wood elves would be like the serfs. So, so there's, a, there's an explicit sort of racial species hierarchy tied to Feywild. Yeah, and then we were thinking about doing a thing where the elves like they don't really they don't uh, procreate the way other races do. Like they have to recycle the souls. And... Can, I, can I just say that uh, to Nerd to, to Doug? Uh, if what you're suggesting is that current capitalism run amok in America will eventually lead to modern day drow culture, I agree with you 100. <laughs> percent We're definitely going down that route. Uh, um, but so the, that, that's interesting, Dave. I I, I would want to know what the differences are um, culturally for them, because then most of their society I would assume is in another dimension. So. I, I it's I get it's more it would be so I guess what we what we kind of did was at some point the the elves began moving from the Feywild or the fairy or whatever we whatever we land on for calling you know our our elven you know the our Feywild they they began a migration uh you know also seeking to take over more territory but then they get cut off so kind of like who's here is here they're they're you know getting back and forth is very rare uh, up until more recently. And so the idea was when one of them would die, then that soul could then be reincarnated into a new elf. The problem being is you might not get a dark elf or a, a you know, a light elf out of that. You, you don't like just because it was a dark elf. So there's a limited number of elf souls, essentially. It's a it's a it's a set amount. Yes. So so that so that kind of like it's more of a Cold War because 
you know, it, you know, if you get killed, you may have just doubled the number on the other side, not, you know, exponentially, not for just because you died, but because you could have just added a birth to their side, you know, and, and vice versa. It, well, you, even if you added a birth to their side, they're still going to take time for that person to be an adult. So it's still worth fighting them, right? Like, it's still worth. Yeah, yeah, it would still be worth it. But, the, but it, you know, and also being elves, they have a very long view. And, and we might have kind of went more with the, all right, you don't necessarily die, like kind of like the Middle Earth thing. You don't necessarily die of old age if you're an elf either. So we were, we were kind of like playing with some of the... We're not, That's we're, kind of how the shard mine worked in, um, in uh, fourth eight. edition. Yeah. I mean, yeah. We, there, but, there was a limited amount of them. You know, they're just the soul that... Re- oh, not the shard mine. I'm sorry, the diva. You know, they reincarnate. Their spirit yeah. was always in flux and when they died they just came back as a new version of them with their memories being kind of questionable yeah so i mean we weren't exactly breaking new ground there but we were kind of pulling back more to the roots and and and, you know i know a lot of people have issues with drow for different reason reasons and we 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 kind of just wanted to get away from the spider worshiping trope that is drow nowadays i mean I, i don't super dig sub races that are physiologically different um when 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 they're really you're talking about a cultural difference you know what i mean like there's in your world there's humans that live in different cultures and they're different ways but we don't give them different stats and different you know what i mean they're just humans or humans or humans everywhere no matter how different a place they live in you know those people that live in a tibetan like monasteries up on a mountain are the same as the people live down in like savannah deserts and it's like these didn't require a different sub race why do elves need all these different sub races when really you're talking about cultural differences, right? Drow could just be elves that come from this shitty culture. Pardon me. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. No, like, and that being said, like, I'm not against the sub races, but culturally you're right because, what you know, why are why are the dwarves, you know, over on this side of the world exactly the same as the dwarves on this other side of the world, and you know, and. You know, they like even if they came from the same place, but they diverged 500 years ago. Chances are they're going to evolve differently culturally, if nothing else. Right. Well, the second half of that was if you're going to have a sub race that is actually like physically different, then really do it different, right? Like, what's the difference between an elf and a, and a wood elf? It's not really that big a deal. I don't know why it warrants different stats. One's a dirty elf. We're one's not a talking about door, completely elf. different creatures here. <laughs> Uh, tea time with oh, we got a couple questions. I'll take this one first. Um, how do you feel about getting rid of the variant human and have every player gaining a feat at second level? That's tea time with Toby. I know in um, the Maze Arcana games, everybody gets a feat at first level, and if you're a human, you get two. I actually thought that using the variant feat would be kind of a cool way to culturally separate uh, humans. Yeah, I, I think they should have came up with a bunch of human-only society feats and had each human take get one for free at first level and then have them not give stats. And then it's just a, an extra thing that humans get. You'd probably have to remove something else. I'm not sure what, but, you know, if they're going to be physically the same but culturally different, then you want to represent that culture through a sub-choice or some kind of category, then that would make sense to me. I don't mind having more feats. I think feats are awesome. They should have made more feats and, and made them a little better. Um, I I know you're. My I, only fear is that they put the stats on the feats, and then if you give people bonus feats, their stats climb up, and so you have a twenty before it before fifth level, and then it's like, where do I go from here? Yeah, I yeah you know, with with the ceiling, I don't know. I, I'm kind of, I, I've been known to be loosey goosey with that. So like yeah, you you give out boons, right? You you give yeah uh, yeah you give what, boons, like plus some amount of pluses to our stats that I I don't remember what they are, so I can't backwards engineer what my original stats are anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, Blood Fang, I think, had a twenty-four strength. Yeah, sure. And you know, we're like fifteenth level though, so you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not not at first. You know, we got to wait at least to like third or something for that. Also, by that level, he probably should have had like a belt of ogre might or something, and that was never going to happen. So. <laughs> not likely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've I've been known to be a little stingy with the magic items. It is actually the downside of the way the way I run the game and, and our group runs a lot of times. Is I don't I don't mind stingy with the items. I just don't like creatures that require magic to hurt them. And then you don't have any. And then you don't have it. it I, I've never liked that mechanic that, that requires magic, and at least in D and D context, because the ma- monsters really aren't like legendary. Like that would make sense for. 
You know what I mean? My example is always like you're fighting the Gorgon. Yeah. You're fighting Medusa, right? A named creature in mytholo- mythology. Everybody in there, everybody around knows that like this is a this is a major thing. So, oh, okay, you need magic to even get near this thing. Okay, sure. But like, you come across a ghost. <laughs> not that a ghost isn't a big deal, but like, it's not a big deal in the D and D world. There's ghosts around. There's multiple of them. Well, at least I don't think anything that's in corporal is a good example. <laughs> Yeah. But but no, but I, I know what you mean. I, I think that's one of the things they did well with fifth edition where it wasn't like all or nothing. Very few monsters are actually immune to to normal weapons. Many of them have resistance, but you can still hurt them. It's just harder. Yeah. It's so, one of many things that leans the game more towards spellcasting though. Yeah, well, yeah. Although right, cause I, as a spellcaster, I don't, I don't have to solve this problem. But as a non-spellcaster, I have to figure out I have to Connive if the world allows, and just beg the GM if the world doesn't allow. Right? Yeah. Can uh, can I beat this werewolf with the mage? <laughs> Does that count as magic? <laughs> Enchant my quick. Put all your magic into yourself, and I will just I will just use you as a club. You grab you you grab the um the druid quick wild shape. I need your claws. <laughs> <laughs> the the barbarian stack. There's the there's the old uh. DC characters, wasn't it? There was a, it was like a caveman and a, and a little girl who could turn herself into a uh, indestructible diamond, and he would use she would like make different shapes for different weapons with her arms and legs, and then he would wield her as a weapon. I vaguely remember that. I have no idea what it's from though. <laughs> I always thought that would be a good char- good characters to make in a uh, supers game. Oh yeah, some mutants and masterminds, and you could probably totally do it. Right. Uh, make one character who's completely indestructible and has some kind of contact damage where if you touch them, you know, you get like sliced up or something. And then another character who can hold them has a weapon. <laughs> and then you, you know, you do like the hammer throw. I throw them at somebody. And then when they get over there, they release their like paralysis and run back to you, jump yeah. back into your hand. <laughs> so uh, DM Don wants to know, what are your thoughts on Middle Earth as a game setting? Never really found solid footing in RPG world discuss. <laughs> I don't love it. Um, the lines are too hard drawn in the sand. I think in Lord of the Rings, the bad guys are the bad guys, the good guys are the good guys. And there's not a lot of overlap. And also, you know, it's a setting made, made for a, a novel and novels are just different than role playing games. You know what I mean? They're just not built for the same purposes. Yeah, there's uh, the same thing. Like I like Redwall. I like the Redwall series a lot. It's like a, like a, shameful pleasure of mine but uh i don't know if it'd make a good i don't think it'd make a good rp setting because the good guys are just always good guys they're real good guys and the bad guys are just unrepentantly crappy bad guys like i don't know not only that like and and i know this is not this is very very unpopular opinion in the community but going back i'm glad i read all the you know the lord of the rings books and the hobbit but going back i can't read them now they're boring to me they yeah, they're tough. Run, they're a tough read. They just run away from everything. Even like the archaic language doesn't really bother me. It's it's just the the story pacing. Like I like modern story pacing. I like action. I like I I like over the top, unrealistic. You know, I don't like gritty anymore. Yeah, for me the the, the problem is like uh, the setting's incredibly worked out. You know, the guy was a, a linguist and a, a lore master. Like that's great. Um, everything's super cool. Except that the plot itself is kind of all over the place. I don't know. Like, the fact that, that Gandalf, like, just disappears for a long time and is unexplained. Or, <laughs> you know, I always remember, like, Gandalf comes to uh, to Bilbo or, or to Frodo and is like, hey, you got to go do this thing. And he's like, nah, I think I'm going to wait around for 30 years. <laughs> he waits for a really long time. And you're like, is this the hero? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, nah, you do it. <laughs> I don't know. There's a, we don't. Have, we should. This is not. A, this is not a uh, tunnel we should go down. Make yeah, sure yeah. <laughs> the rancor. The rancor will be. Will be mighty. Yeah. If I looked at Lord of the Rings as a setting, I would go. Well, what would I play? And I'm not given a lot of options. Nor do I see how you balance those options, given all the precedents set. Right. Like. Although elves I. Are just, elves are just really, really better than everyone else, and there's no rational reason they should be mechanically balanced in any way. And I will say though, with your you know the way you feel about magic, that the magic system should be real, real right up your uh, right up your alley because it's really lame. 
Yeah, I don't have a problem with the magic of that, in that world. That, that, that works great to me. Um, don't, don't piss Gandalf off. He will totally use this pyrotechnic spell. <laughs> I never got the impression Gandalf had memorized his spells in advance. So I'm, I'm down with that. <laughs> well, yeah, what, both of them? Like, you never really did anything impressive. There's a reason why he had a sword. <laughs> right, I mean, he was... It was clearly, like, not something he liked to be vulgar about. He didn't want to throw magic everywhere as solutions to everything. And that could have been a moral choice or a mechanical choice for him. Because we didn't really get to see Saruman throw a lot of spells out either. Yeah, I mean, um, they embellished but at least when he did, movies. it was like, well, you know, I can do this when I need to do it. <laughs> they embellished for the movies, but in the swords, for the most part, it was like... He was using his sword, so... Yeah. I like a, I like a, a Warhammer-type magic where... You can always do it, but if you do it, it's risky because because magic is chaotic and and it you know it'll bite you. So, so there's actually two stream games of Warhammer going on right now. Which the the Fantasy Flight system? There's the Fantasy Flight system. Uh, Jim Davis is running on Encounter Roleplay, and there are only a couple of sessions into that. And then on Devil Devil's Luck Gaming, uh, they are running Five E using Warhammer as the setting yeah. and and they're actually well relatively speaking they're local they're in, out of new york that's cool i really i really wanted to get into the fantasy flight one I, i'm super interested in that system and i heard it was better than a lot of people gave it credit for and they also put out a uh a rules back to let let you play an ogre man eater and i was like oh man those are my dudes <laughs> ogre man eater yeah in a in fantasy battle that was my army where the the ogres um the Ogre Kingdoms. And uh, one of the things is they basically, you know, they're kind of like um, Cossack slash Mongolian step step living. They just live out in this in this kind of hinterlands. Um, but they're always hungry. So they one of their one of their main societal things is they're they're so hungry they got to go out and travel and like see the world. They have this like lust for they have a wanderlust essentially built built baked into them. So they go out and they become mercenaries in the other countries because they're ogres and they you know. They're big and powerful, but also, you know, people will pay them and they can use that money or just eat things that are around them. So they're they're down for that. So the man eaters are the kind of the uh, slightly more elite. They've gone out and they've seen the world a bit um, and they're working out in the outer world, not in their own kingdom. So and if playing an ogre man eater and that was real appealing to me. I always want to play an ogre, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have like zero knowledge of of Warhammer from the game. I. I just I read it. I probably read like twenty books from from there at least. Yeah, I mean, because the, the Felix and Gosh, Gortrak series is like you know twelve to fifteen books alone, and then there was there was a couple a couple others. Oh, you know what the um the there was also a Dark Elf trilogy as well. Uh, Malice, no, not Malice. Malachi. Now mm, now I forget. I just know I know his his riding Drake was spite. <laughs> oh, okay. oh, maybe it was Malice Dark Soul. <laughs> Real, yeah, I like that setting a lot. It's tough, and, and, and the the funny part is it's had so many different game systems that are wildly different. You know, I mean, like mechanically so different over the over the uh, over the last twenty thirty years that it's like, <laughs> how's it gonna feel in this one? Right, the old editions you could have a character lose arms and legs or just die in character creation because of the harshness of the world, but I don't imagine that's how modern systems work. I also found out recently that the newest one, which is put out by not Fancy Flight, um, uses a percentile system. So it's probably a throwback to to older systems, which I just was like, oh, I I don't need to follow this anymore. Percentage system, I'm done. Uh, You don't like percentiles? (laughs) Totally worthless. You don't like the D20 either. What do you like? D12. Well, you want a D12, on a don't scale you? Of, on a scale of dice I don't like, it starts at percentages and it moves down. Um, if, if, if you told me that in your game system, 1% out of 100 was a meaningful decider in what was going to happen in a die roll, I would call bullshit on your system. And then I would go, well, does 2% matter? Does 3% matter? Once you get to 5%, I go, why aren't you on a D20? <laughs> right? Like, there's just no rational reason to me why you would ever use a percentile die. Uh, that's funny. I think they're. I think uh, on Encounter Roleplay they're using the new. Unless they're using the old system, but I think they're using percentile dice. Yeah. I don't know. If it's the Fantasy Flight one that runs on a on a system similar to the the Star Trek the Fantasy Star Flight Wars. Star Trek, 
Wait, yeah, Star Wars. Sorry. Yeah, the the custom dice. <laughs> now I don't think they're using that. I think they're using percentile because I heard those guys talking about it and saying something about percentile dice. I mean, the old the old fantasy battle system used a percentile system where I would have to roll a, per- a percentage or better, I think, to hit you. But then you would take the two numbers of the percentage and flip them to find out where my attack landed on your body. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just so weird. So there's a rules question from Tea Time with Toby. I'll get to it real quick. So with a Kensei Monk with Sharpshooter and Crossbow Expert, would you get two hand crossbow attacks with unarmed att- attacks? The Crossbow Expert and Sharpshooter actually aren't relevant in this part of the question. It's just a matter, is it considered a Monk weapon? Is it, if it is, then you can always flurry of blows and use your bonus actions to take unarmed strikes. And you get the pick, you know, you know I don't know exactly what what uh what the stipulations are for your kensei monk weapons but if you can pick a cr- cr- crossbow as one then you can absolutely do that so easy easy peasy so yeah i don't i don't know if i like the idea of a uh a cross a hand crossbow monk uh, it's not your character. You don't have to like it. Yeah, <laughs> it, it it is a it's, it's a little weird. I mean, you know, when I think um, there's a gulf you have to for me there's a there's a divide you have to get across, and that's that monks seem to be not about mechanical stuff and artifice, right? They're about physical, personal, physical perfection, and then you're using this highly de- developed mechanical weapon. But <laughs> you just have to you just have to connect those dots for me, like story wise. Yeah. I mean, the bow would make uh, would make sense because you have Zen archery. You know, oh, so. oh, yeah, I think that's awesome. A, a long bow, like Kensai. I always wanted to make, um, and I used it in my, one of my board games for one of my characters. Was a like a um, you could do it in older edition, be like a wisdom based blind uh, blind Zen archer kind of deal. Yeah, you know what I mean. Where you you don't you just kind of hear for the sound in the wind and let it go. <laughs> that's a cool character. Uh, Spacey Galvin, did they say when the Esper Genesis core book is being released? I, you know what? I'm not really sure. Uh, had Rich made it on, we would have definitely answered that question. I, I know at Origins they're looking to release, um, the uh, organized play for it. So hopefully before then, uh, I know, you, I'm pretty sure you can pick up the, the PDF now over on Drive Through RPG. Uh, so, uh, Tea Time with Toby said he's going for kind of a, uh, 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 like the the gun kata, yeah, the gun fu. Yeah, uh, what was that movie about before Matrix that kind of defined that uh, the uh, Christian Bale one? <laughs> I'm not familiar with that. Yeah, it, before Matrix came out, it was a uh, I think it was Christian Bale. I could be wrong about that. And uh, you know, it was in some kind of dystopian society, and it, it basically really put the put the gun fu like you know he, he shoots shoots 15 dudes in a circle around him while he goes through a little dance. Equilibrium. There you go. You got all the answers in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, you know, I like the way it was done in John Wick. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, and I think they're doing like a third one of that, right? That's coming out soon. Probably. They keep making money. Yeah. So they'll keep doing, it's all right. I like Keanu Reeves. <laughs> that was him, right? Yeah. Yeah. His, the 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 jujitsu he does in there is actually pretty good too. And I like the way they mix that in. Not not the greatest actor, but definitely uh, he's into the kung fu action scene. He's definitely expressed a love for it, regardless of how good the movies are that he makes about it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that that's definitely a comment and a statement. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Zarif Gaming says John Woo invented gun gun fu. Are you sure? <laughs> I actually have no idea where that came where where it came from. Well, I wouldn't mind playing like a wire fu game. I've wanted to play a, a, a like a what's what's it called? Um, oh no, I'm blanking on. Keep thinking wushu, but that's not the word. Yeah, wushu is a form of martial arts. Yeah, wushu is a form of martial arts. But there's a term for um, it's like the world of warriors. Um, and in old martial arts movies, they'll, you'll see the different characters that, you know, if a guy goes, oh, I'm, I'm so-and-so of the golden, of the golden, you know, hammer, you know, and he's talking to the guy of liquid blade. Right. And they both, they both understand that they're in the, 
they're in the world of warriors. I'm just blanking on the term for it, but you know, and the idea is you're in normal world. Like there's there's normal people that do normal things. Oh yeah, um, uh, the mighty house. But of you understand Russian. that we are both warriors and we deal with warrior things, right? <laughs> I always thought that'd be a great setup for a for a role playing game to just be like, no, we're all adventurers. We understand that we deal with adventurer stuff, right? Like. There's a there's a society and culture of adventurers and adventuring that we are interested in, and it's different than the modern than, than the um, general people. The uh, but I always wanted to play in a in a kung fu wire wire fu you know crouching tiger hidden dragon setting. Um, those are all based on books that are called uh, like Tales from the Water Margin. You know what I mean? Like that'd be so fun. <laughs> the Mighty Hab says is uh, uh, wushi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is what it's called. Which I'm probably not pronouncing that right because I don't pronounce it uh, right. My friend was working on a role playing is is working on a role playing system, and in that, I combined my love of playing ogres with my love of that sort of character background. So uh, I made a I made a um kind of a ogre. He was a he was a bodyguard in the in the in his culture. The ogres were kind of like a, a vassal state to. Um, the human culture. So he had a human noble he, who he was like a direct servant of, you know, and functioned as a bodyguard slash servant because he's a big giant ogre. Um, and in that setting, his his master had died or something, and he had gone had to go on, go off on his own and kind of make up for his dishonor of having had his master die. And so I played that character as if he was only interested in the world of warriors, right? Like he would talk to other people and deal with them, but he was like, I don't care about money. I don't care about this. I'm looking for a challenge for my for my martial skill. You know what I mean? So he he was he was just when he encountered other significant adventurers, he would be like, oh, OK. Like I, I am up and I try to like, is he in in this in my in my subculture? You know what I mean? Is he in the world of adventurers? Is, is he a card carrying member? Right. Then I will deal with him. <laughs> but everybody else I will respectfully not be concerned with. <laughs> So, we're going to be finishing up my game before too long. What do you want to play next? What do you want to do next? The the Goblo game? Yeah. Well, if you level us every session, <laughs> it'll definitely be 20 before soon. Um, what would I want to play next? Who's jamming? Are you going to do, are you going to run again? I we will. get together so so infrequently anymore. It's it's I know. It's hard to like keep any kind of momentum. The uh the, we the played it months. My fault. I mean, it's my fault, but we haven't played it months. Damn you! Well, we've been playing, <laughs> so we usually, we usually, we usually do keep going. Um, and, and that was like one of the things that that you know I figured out a long time ago. If you want a group to stay together, you just need to keep playing. If, uh, my thing right. is, as long as we I got, don't know like, that you've been playing because you haven't uploaded the videos. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. There's that. I know it's terrible. It, uh, it's. The thing with uploading the videos is they take a long time to render, and my computer right, is garbage. Think of the, you haven't rendered the videos, Dave. That's why I don't know what happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And my computer is garbage, right? So I can't render a video and work on the computer. I have to generally set it up at night and just let it do its thing overnight. And by the time I get to the time where I should probably do I'm like just like, I'm done. I'm not going yeah, plus there's always a chance something gets locked up in the middle of the night and you lose it all. Oh well, there's that chance too, but you know that's that's less of an issue. It has more to do with like getting to a certain time and it's like, oh, I should be editing and letting this video render, but I'm done for the night. It's midnight. I don't want to work anymore. <laughs> uh, what would I want to run? What do I want to play next? Mm -hmm. I mean, the question would be, would you be running another game with the same the same group of people, right? Yeah, or I don't would. Know. I mean, Ted's running a game. I, I would hope that you would take a player seat for a while. And I mean, I, I think that's always the right way to go, especially if you guys have like a shared world is you should cycle out GMs. Well, so uh, I know. So Ted runs a game, too. Like we both. Right, he's run already a in a game. He's already running a game. So yeah. That's, that's, so and I yeah. play I play in that game. And then usually we have like a third game going on, uh, you know, which has been kind of off and on. And that's like we're playing Star Wars with that. Ted's running 5e um, and he's a little bit ahead of ahead of our game so that one's going to wrap up even sooner and i think he's trying to push off the gm into nate and so he might uh take a crack at it but, where where is his game in relation to ending as well uh, i mean i think both of them end relatively soon and that would be a good time to 18th le we're like 18th level so they're right so they're even closer than, than, yeah than... 
So we still have to go to hell and kill a demon lord in that game. And then it can end. I just got married <laughs> in that game, too. No sleep till demon lord. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. Yeah, so yeah, so I don't know if I want to run uh, another D&D game or run a different game. Or if somebody else wants to run, that's fine. We'll make Todd run. I mean, I, <laughs> I would run if... If I had any ability or time or, you know, to do it, uh, I think it would be fun to see how you guys respond to the way I run a game. Um, or just fun to watch you force you to play fourth edition. <laughs> <laughs> I would play it. I don't care. I mean, they don't have, I, I still have not got to play that. I really want to play Gamma World. Uh, which version? Um, I only know of the three five and the fourth edition version. I, I liked them both. I think the three five one was just a real sloppy mess, but it was still fun. I like the fourth edition one fine. It it, it was very like one off and, and goofy and fun and didn't didn't make itself a long term game, which I thought was okay for that setting. So uh, the the game. I know there's older ones. But I don't know anything about them. The game we we played the fourth edition version and Scott ran a game. I, I'm not sh- I don't remember how many sessions it went, but yeah. he introduced like Star Trek, the original series. He introduced Thundercats. Sure. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there was uh, Warhammer 40k. He used right. he used the Lord of the Rings because riffs would just open up all over the place. <laughs> we yeah, ended up yeah. with like Space Marine armor and all kinds of craziness. I feel like the 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 four E Gamma World pushed it a little far into the into the table into the board game realm with the cards. Um, so I think it would be that would be a really. I mean, I liked most of the mechanics in it. I love the the weapon mechanics. I'm I I really feel like they didn't they should have kept doing that for other systems. Um, but uh, so I, if I if I ran it or if I was running in it, I would hope that whoever was running it would adjust the card thing because it was a little too it was too much to draw new cards every combat and just find out that you randomly spawned mutant powers left and right it made your it made your choices or your character feel less interesting if if zany completely you know completely zany stuff kept popping up right oh for this for this combat my guy has laser eyes yeah but i really wanted to play this like rat swarm that i was playing well whatever they got laser eyes now (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. yeah that that part of it was kind of uh, is kind of a little goofy because your character kind of can flux and change so much. I mean, yeah, yeah. They, they they do a story way to kind of explain it, but it's still kind of weird. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I, I've always wanted to play Gamma World, but I, with, with the proviso that you tone down the card play a little bit. Yeah, or maybe make it set cards or something like that. I guess would work as well. Yeah, I always thought you should get the cards because something happened in the story, and then whether or not you keep them or not would be a roll after every combat or something. Let's see if it faded away. You know what I mean? There's a, um, there's an online random generator for characters for that. And it's amazing. Yeah. Ted just printed out like 40 characters one time. Yeah. We were going to run it at, we were going to run game world in store and, and me and me and Nicole sat around and just rolled up like 10, 10, 11 random characters. Yeah. Well, I, I guess wizards of coast had, had it on their site. You just push a button and pop out a character. And I, I think I made my character that way, and he had a five intelligence. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was a lot of fun to play. I just played him like a toddler, essentially. Uh, my friend Finn, he had, he got um, giantoid and something else, and he decided that his character was Modok, but without his chair. Mm-hmm. So it was just a big giant head and a little tiny body that had to kind of drag it around. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, I've, and Giant Droid had was one of the few ones that had a, a an encounter power that was like I slam you with one of my giant body parts, and it was his head. So he was like a mental character, like he had psychic powers and stuff. But every once in a while, he would just roll his big giant head on you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I was a sesamoid uh, giant, sesamoid and giant giant. So I just played him as a big toddler stone golem, and then my other character I rolled up. Was that one I might have picked, and it was ectoplasmic wheeled. So I played him as as a ghost that was in a wheelchair. I think he'd be the ghost of uh, Gizmo Duck. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it could be absolutely. The character I had got was uh, something swarm. I think it was a cockroach swarm. Yeah. So he was a sentient swarm of cockroaches, and I was like, "Well, I don't want to do cockroaches. It's a little gross." So I changed him to a sent because you could just reskin the thing as long as the 
basic principles were in there. Uh, so the character was a sentient swarm of moths. You know what I mean? So they, so there were a bunch of moths that formed themselves into a sort of humanoid shape. But uh, to, to, <laughs> to make it goofy and funny, I said that they were all communist moths and there was one like dictator that had a little desk on his head. <laughs> like on the, on the head of the, of the swarm, there was a dictator that sat at a desk. And so they were, they were all about the, you know, the community. They were about like the great empire of the communist moths, except when they saw a sweater or anything made out of wool, in which they would, they would just lose their shit and go try to eat it. <laughs> I can't get him. Oh my God. Now I'm seeing a South Park episode where you can't get him out of the closet. <laughs> but that's a lot of that's a lot of fun. I mean it wouldn't be a long term game but that would be a fun like short short web series <laughs> yeah but that's good you know i might run that at a convention or something that's that's actually that's a great game for that where you're just going to be ridiculous and yeah plus it's one of the few games where being given your character doesn't doesn't feel bad because because you know. in theory you're supposed to be random doing it anyway it's random anyway yeah. yeah and you get your character and then you can kind of make up what it means right like they're just kind of general terms you know what i mean it, it doesn't have to be exactly what it's saying it's it could be something that those mechanics make sense for so dm don wants to know have either of you played sla industries or cult from the 90s i've mm-hmm. not heard of either of those nah Sorry, That's, dude. You know, most of my uh, most of my gaming experimenting happened within like the first two years of really playing, and we would just so so it's like a lot of old games like Gangbusters and Twilight Two Thousand, one of the early Conan games, DC the Mayfair version, and because we like I guess there was one summer where we just would we just pulled out like game after game and played like a session, and then probably went back to day to day. I've uh, I've seen a lot of systems, but not necessarily played a lot of systems. I, I started out in Vampire and White Wolf, and I, those are still my favorite systems. Um, and some of my favorite writing in games is Vampire and uh, Werewolf and all the sundry World of Darkness stuff. And then we tried to play because I never played. I, I mean, when I was real young, I played Second Edition, but it, you know, it was barely. It, I would barely call that using the game what we did. I mean, we would run around in the park with swords, and call it TNT. <laughs> <laughs> but after that, uh, you know, when I when I was in high school, later in high school, we got into uh, White Wolf, and then when three five came out, everybody jumped on that D and D train and, and never got off. Um, and so years and years and years of you know ten years of three five, ten years of fourth edition, and now you know whatever's going on now, and it's only now that I'm really we're starting to see some other stuff kind of come into play in my repertoire we played shadow run we play, tried like a game of shadow run a game of gurps a couple games of dungeon world you know but not as much not as much reaching out as i would i would like personally well i think it, i i think it is a it's a time thing right it's it's like people even ask on videos like why don't you guys talk about more I'll get you Zareft. Uh Why don't you guys talk about more um, games or more systems? I'm like, because I only have so much time. You know, I mean, especially, I, I ask you that. I'm always like, yeah, you yeah, guys yeah. Need to buy other stuff. <laughs> but especially when we were working full time and then doing Nerdarchy as well, you know, and having families, like, you know, don't well, have... Plus, I mean, it's business reasons for you guys as well. Like, d and is, is the big fish. You can't not talk about d and Yeah, I mean... Anytime you're not talking about D&D, you're... you're you're not serving the big fish, though. So. <laughs> it's it, it, from like from a from a content creator standpoint. It's like, do you want to get a thousand or less views on a video? <laughs> yeah. If the answer is yes, talk about something that is not D and D. Yeah, I mean, my you know my big argument for that is always that it's a self fulfilling prophecy. You know what I mean? Um, and it's kind of like, well, if, we, if no one talks about it, then no one's ever going to talk about it. And if they don't, all everybody talks about is D and D, then that's all, you know. That, yeah. that reinforces that kind of aspect. And I, I was listening to um, Revisionist History of Malcolm Gladwell recently, and he talked about weak link versus strong link kind of thinking. And so I think about continually talking about D&D as a strong link mindset, because D&D doesn't need more people talking about it. 
they have the biggest market share and the biggest name recognition in, in the world for role playing games. Um, so is it helping to talk more about a system that everybody's talking about, or is it, you know, more helpful to talk about systems that are underappreciated? And so I, I would like there to be more talk about underappreciated systems because I think that they're doing more inventive and creative things because they have the room to do it because they don't have the weight of nostalgia and history that D&D &D does. <laughs> so it's my soapbox. I'm sorry, and, guys. That's and that's soapbox. also why, like, I'm thinking the next game I go in, I, if I run an, another game, it won't be it may not be D&D. &D. I might yeah. go somewhere else with it. And that's but, not my other argument is that I just think that other systems are better suited for um, live play on video. Like, I just don't think the mechanics of D and D particularly suit uh, casting very well. I think I think a game like Dungeon World just gets it across better. It's intrinsically theoremite. There is no there is no real <laughs> rules that 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 you have to extrapolate into theater of the mind. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, I guess it really depends too what kind of stream you're doing as far as. As as far as games go, like I mean, Critical Role, they break out the minis and terrain. Uh, Maze Arcana, they do as well. I mean, when we were actually visiting them, they they had, and you know, it's a luxury being in LA where you actually live near and are friends with set designers. They had someone build in I think four pieces, uh, the throne room of Breland, and it was amazing. And it, including had little bear heads that you could you know. That were mounted on the columns magnetically, so you could switch them out if you wanted your throne room to be something else. I, I get that, and that's probably super cool for them. And I, yeah. you know, I would love to be involved in that if I was in the game. Yeah. But I have to ask: Was that the most interesting part of the stream? You know, did was that really fun to watch um, the minis on the table and the rolling of the dice? And and I don't think that's the part that people are going to remember. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I agree. Like, I don't. I think people watch it for the interactions and the role playing, and I just don't think that any of that really is helping that. And I don't, nor do I think the mechanical heavy system in D and D really feeds into that very well. As opposed to, I think it's just better solutions. But because D and D is the big name, that that's what everybody's going to do for for reasons like you said. Do you want less views? You know, I yeah. tried to look up Dungeon World Community on on YouTube, and it, it's there, but it's not obviously. It's big. <laughs> you just pull up a big metal finger. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know. I mean, I, I love when um, yeah. Chris Perkins, you know, pulls out all the big stuff and they fight a giant beholder or, you know, this this time they're doing Voltron. But I have to put it in the context that these guys have a, a huge platform to begin with and they're all really well known. So Yeah, and they have a budget and they have PA. Also, he works for D&D &D and has stuff, an agenda. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> True. Zarif, I'm going to grab your question real quick and we'll go back to this topic. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, okay. chat. I'm, I'm, I'm no, no big deal. What's y'all's favorite thing from Tome of Foes? I don't, you know, you know, we are kind of like reading it as we put out videos on it. Like this week, we're going to do the first part of the Blood War, which is Devils. Uh, and that should be dropping, uh, what's today? Tuesday? Probably Thursday. So I, don't, I haven't read enough to have a favorite part. I mean, there's a lot, of, like I've skimmed through and read a bunch of the monsters. And, you know, there's a lot of cool monsters. I don't know. The devils that were linked to Tiamat. Um, it looks like 70% demons and devils, right? Uh, there's a lot of them. There's definitely a lot of them. I wouldn't say 70%. Uh, I mean, there's a chunk. Cause you, I mean, you're getting all the, the uh, arch devils and demon lords. So that alone, plus you're going to get some other ones. But the the devils that... There's a lot of monsters, too, that like a lot of people are going to never use. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. So the... A bishy, a biche? I don't know, but they're like the devils that are kind of linked to Tiamat. I thought I thought those were really cool. And did they come out in fourth edition or the end of third? The bishy? Yeah, they're like what like, are they? Again? They're, so they're devils, but they're linked to Tiamat. Uh, I actually want to say those might have came out in. I definitely remember seeing them in in fourth edition. They might have been in three five. Because okay. I think those came, at least where I remember them from, was the um, one of a, mo a module they ran in the in the Nentir Vale, which I think started actually in three, at the end of three five. But it was a war against the Tiamat um, orc army. Um, it was called a uh, War of the Crimson Claw or something. I remember I ran it for I ran it back in the day. And so one of T you would have you know eventually you would fight Tiamat's as uh, aspect or whatever. But one of their hand you know one of the servant one of the higher level 
threats and servants you would start hitting were like humanoid dragon, you know, themed on, on all the chromatic uh, angle. Oh, all I know, back in my day, <laughs> back in my day, Tiamat guarded the first gate to hell. <laughs> <laughs> you kids. Tiamat's well, a good villain, but I don't know. It feels a little played out. Yeah, yeah, especially after the cartoon. So many, so much, so much dragons. I, I'm, 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 I'm done with dragons. Can, too many. Can we have more dungeons and less dragons? Yeah. Uh, well, that's why I, I try not to use them too much in my games. People always say that, like, but it's it becomes weird when you're like throwing a dragon out every other session or a bunch yeah. of dragons. In my last Aberon game, I actually used a surprising number of dragons because when a plot involved the draconic prophecy and and stuff, uh, even then I was like. <laughs> <laughs> but, but were they monsters to fight or were they more like NPCs? No, they were monsters. I mean, uh, the villain was going to be a dragon eventually who was in disguise as a human for the course of the campaign. But um, but they would they would come across... Uh, the setup was that at different stages on the quest that they were on, they would run into dragons that were after them for reasons they didn't understand. So they would get they got attacked from very early levels by a big blue dragon while they were on a skyship that tried to tear the skyship apart. I don't like big action scenes. So... The dragon shows up and goes like, I'm, I don't know what he's up to, but I'm going to destroy you guys to cut it off before it gets too bad. And they're like, what are you talking about? Right. And the idea was that this other dragon was manipulating the party to do things. And the these these, uh, you know, and these other faction of dragons were trying to stop his plans. And then the party was getting kind of ground between the wheels. So they would run into dragons who had been screwed over by this. This I, it was going to be a gold dragon. Um, they were running into dragons that were screwed over by this gold dragon over the course of what he was, his machinations. And so, you know, they just kept running into these dragons who got messed up. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I wanted to jump back to when we are talking about other systems. One of the reasons I do the live chats is so we can talk about other systems and have other people on and, you know, indie games and things like that. We actually yeah. have, I'm going to do a GM roundtable on uh, the next, I think the 28th. Which it's all indie, it's all indie RPG designers. So I'm gonna have three, uh, three different, three maybe four different people on, and you know, kind of give them a platform to talk about what they're doing. You know, challenges being an indie uh, RPG game designer, that kind of stuff, and like even like sprinkled throughout our channel, we actually do play other games. It's just not as as prevalent. I mean, we we just like playing Dungeons and Dragons for one. And and it's also a time thing, but I think we do a greater service to those other systems by being a D and D channel that then also talks about other stuff. Okay. <laughs> well, it's like you said, like that's where the largest audience is. Well, if you, if if we were to do, say you if you were to do a channel and it was only about indie RPGs, you would only speak to people that are looking for that. You know, some people think RPG and they think they don't look past like that first thing they find and what's the first thing they're probably going to find. Is, is I, I guess. I mean, I would hope that people would, that D&D players who were, were looking for something else would seek out other other stuff. And if you, if, I mean, like, it's a momentum thing, right? Like if you, if you talk, if you only talked about any RPGs, it would be tough because you'd be talking about lots of different systems as opposed to one monolith, right? That's just easier to talk about one monolith. Um, but I, I would hope that people would seek it out. And it also just comes down to, you know, percent bandwidth, right? Like if you guys put out 20 videos and 19 of them are about D&D and one's about an indie thing, you know, it's different than if you put out, you know, out of 20, 10 D&D videos and 10 and 10 other systems <laughs> sure but th that being said too like if you look at just size of channels like when a much larger channel talks about that even it's only even just one video you probably get so much more exposure to that thing than a channel that just dedicates all of their bandwidth to that because yeah yeah i mean and the other thing i would say is like I think it takes a little more concerted effort to talk about a role playing system than than an offhand video can can qualify. That's why I say like it would be it would be interesting to play other systems because I think that's what really shows shows what's going on in them. And, and well, um, I then, think you need you know you can't just say like here's what this does different and then and then talk about all the minutia of D and D because you're just for bandwidth you're just giving so much focus on on the on the on the big picture versus a kind of vague glimpse of this is a possibility over here that can and, and advocates as well like you know when dm talks about how much he likes um warhammer you yeah know I mean? 
And then I want to see him run a Warhammer game. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. that's what that's what really. Well, you can see that on Encounter Roleplay now. It's is he? Yeah, that he's the one. Yeah, Jim Davis is the one running it. Oh man, I, I wish I was in on that. <laughs> and so that so that's kind of like the the other thing to, too is like stream games is actually just another niche inside of a niche, right? Because right. there's a lot of people that will watch videos like this and and the theorycraft videos, but they'll never watch the stream games. Uh, there's a small percentage that will only watch that, and then there's a percentage that will watch everything. And, and you know, we and we just know that from looking, because we've just got a lot of numbers that we can look at. Uh, a lot of times, a lot of times, like, if you're talking about YouTubing, uh, the, the, the lowest uh, common den- domin- denominator thing you could actually do is play stream games. Because the amount of time investment for the return on it isn't very good but you know we feel as as it as um youtubers and gamers that we have to show people us playing the games and while well, we enjoy playing the games as well but you know from like this from a pure youtube standpoint uh even like i think darn forge cast had someone edit his channel had uh hired a consultant and they're like you should stop streaming games <laughs> so it was literally part of their advice that's 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 interesting. Um, uh, Twitch is a better platform for that too, because it's different. Yeah, sure, people sure. digest content over there differently. Like they expect to go to Twitch, and and it's more of like a place where they want to hang out for a long time. Compared, you know, compared to YouTube, it's kind of like hit it and quit it. Yeah, I don't know, because I, I, like I can't get into Critical Role. I just don't want to listen to them play for that long, because um, I like interactive media. So. Like I like your chats because I can go on the I can talk to the other people in the chat room as, as equally as important as, as listening to you guys to me because I'm an interactive person. Like I, I I'm not I'm not super good at like passively listening to stuff. And that's why Twitch is also really good because a lot of people a lot of right. times people appeal to that. And right, then right. but so then you kind of get into the where the people are streaming the games and then like financially you can influence the games depending on the stream you're watching, Hunger Games style. Yeah, I saw you guys talking about that the other day. That was pretty funny to me. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it it's inter- it's just an interesting time to be alive and playing games because the internet component just adds something different to it. And, you know, whether, no matter what you like, you can probably find what you're looking for. Someone's, someone's out there doing it. Like, I think we were, me and Ted were talking about, like, when we do... Uh, the I'm gonna rag on Ted a little bit. Our next, you know, the next version of our gameplays, and he's like, he was looking at c- Critical Role. He's like, and we could do those intros the way they do, like the trailers for each player. I'm like, um, Ted, our our production, uh, our production value for our gameplays are shit. Why would you put that? Why would you go through the trouble of doing these like scripted scenes that are really cool, and then then it's gonna go from that pan to us sitting around your your table in your basement gaming? <laughs> yeah, it's tough because I, I mean that that would be a big question. You were talking about like, well, what should we do next? And yeah. that would be a big question I would ask. Is I mean, I love playing with you guys in person. You know, it's great to be around the table, but I have to wonder if the the game itself wouldn't do better on your channel if it was done online because i think that the way that ingest quest and a bunch of the other games work where you get to see everybody's face and you could have that overlay that shows the character art you know what i mean like i for the viewer i wonder if that's not a better thing and so there's certainly probably a community of people who are like no nah, i like seeing the table and seeing everybody stand yeah. around it i feel like that's probably a smaller community than the people who you know if even if they don't express it you know, cognizantly, or just like being able to. I, personally, I I think seeing people's faces and seeing the character art and the little overlay is fun. I mean, and we could do we can do something like that in person. I mean, there's definitely. Uh, we each have a camera in front of us at the table. <laughs> I I can well maybe not a camera, but we could definitely do three or four cameras. You know, webcams and run it to OBS and. Oh, uh, that's true. That's how Critical Role does it. They're all like lined up at a little desk. Yeah. You know, and do an overlay, and we could we could probably do something like that. I mean, if if we had you know if we had someone extra that was there hanging out, you could even do switching. Right. And, right. I mean, there is definitely cool things you can do, but it is it is different, it's challenging, and and yeah, and I mean, I, you, you know, have to I'm, focus. I like fourth edition. I like tactical map play, 
But even in the go- in the game of the Goblos, whenever the minis hit the table and we start rolling dice, I'm like, how many people are tuning off on this? Because it's just not fun watching people roll dice. You know what I mean? The, la- the last session of Ted's game, and I kind of talked about this a little bit somewhere else. I don't forget. I forget where, but it was like people were shopping and prepping. And I was like, this has got to be lame as fuck for people to watch. Oh, man. The, shop- the shopping adventure. Ugh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and because, and we're not doing like amazing, cool role playing with voices like Critical Role or something, you know? When they yeah. do it, they can get away with it because Matt Mercer is going to role play with himself different characters that you can distinguish, you know, who's talking and. Right. And, and, you know, each one of the players is an accomplished voice actor as well. We're just a bunch of people playing the game. Plus, you know, he, he very much strikes me as the kind of GM who's got wheels within wheels within wheels. And you guys like to run seat of your pants. So it's like, we're in the market, okay? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, obviously with the Scarlet Sisterhood and their shopping adventures, like, you know, they make the fun for themselves to a degree. But if, if everybody's not on, on, on board for it, then... It, it drags. I hate. I I remember whole session, whole nights of shopping in three five, and I was just like, "Why are we doing this?" <laughs> if this was in a movie or a book, I would have I would have turned it off <laughs> or fast forwarded. You, know I mean? I, I, you know, one of the things that uh, we did was we went to a um, a Dugar merchant. Right. And I was playing a mountain dwarf, and like my mountain dwarf, there's no way he in hell he's buying from a Dugar anything. <laughs> <laughs> Why? So I, it's just, you think it's cursed or just general principle or general principle? What money? Principle. Yeah, and, and oh, he's also a smith, and he's also he's also made a couple of high level magic items at this point. So he's there's no way he's buying from this Dugar. So you know, me as a player just kind of faded back, and you know my rationale for my character was he was just making sure that he, they didn't get swindled and you know, nothing, you know, nothing shady was happening. So I just let, you know, let them do their thing for, you know, for most of that session. And Ted's like, I feel bad. Cause you didn't really interact. I'm like, that's fine. It's, you know, and later in that session, I did do stuff like I ended up getting married, but, uh, <laughs> so no, no big deal. No, no big <laughs> deal. Yeah. So I was like, mm, it's fine. I, I don't mind. But the, from the, from the producer side of things, I'm like, this has got to be way boring to watch. <laughs> so, yeah, and a right. lot of times we try and fast forward that stuff. And like you said, like with the Scarlet Sister, it's different because the way those players interact with each other and the NPCs, they're, they're always entertaining. Yeah. But it's tough too, because like, it depends on the tone of the game as well. Like the Scarlet Sisterhood's a little, a little goofy, obviously in Jess quest is real goofy. So, filling in those those boring parts with just zaniness is is not super hard but if but if you're going for a different tone you know what i mean like what was the fury game on 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 saber dice like i i you can't it's hard to it's harder to maintain a serious or a, a dark tone or a dramatic tone when you're doing mundane stuff i guess is what i would say yeah. Uh, real quick for the chat. Yes, uh, we are going to reschedule. I'm not sure when yet for the Esper Genesis and emergency came up that literally happened while we were in the Zoom call. So uh, unfortunately, we'll, we will get back to that at some point. But and we're actually past the hour mark anyway. Um, but I do appreciate you coming on, Anthony, last uh, last minute. So these guys didn't have to just listen to me yammer about I don't know what. <laughs> Anytime, Dave. I got a big mouth and I'm opinionated. I, I'll fill stream. No problem. Yeah. Also, I'm home all day now, so, you know, what am I going to do? I, you know, we shoot so many videos. Me sitting here and pontificating about I don't know what. Uh, I'd be like, I don't know what to talk about, guys. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I think I was on a couple of your early videos and I got a lot of hate in the comments. Because <laughs> people are like, this guy thinks he knows everything. It's like, well, I'm just willing to, I'm willing to yap about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, you... Uh, Anthony has always had a strong opinion and willing to share it. That's for sure. Nothing wrong with that. It's about gaming. It's not politics, people. It doesn't matter. <laughs> what? Heresy. Gaming is <laughs> life. It's just a game. Well, thanks for coming on, and thanks, everyone, for hanging out in the chat. Appreciate everyone, and until next time, stay nerdy. Stay nerdy, everybody.